The first act of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 10151 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to today's business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10151. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. If I now put the question to the Chamber, the question is that motion number 10151, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Question number one is Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to support employment in the oil and gas sector. Minister Fergus uh, The Scottish Government published its oil and gas strategy. Uh, the Scottish Government, together with the Enterprise Network, have delivered an extra 80 companies who are account managed. We have led delegations to many destinations all over the world. We have provided an extra £6.5 million to establish Energy Skills Scotland. We have ring-fenced 500 modern apprenticeships for energy. We work with Opito Oil & Gas UK and many others in the industry to deliver skills in a coordinated fashion. We have set up the Oil & Gas Innovation Centre and I have personally met with over 100 companies in the sector in Aberdeen and elsewhere to lead our support for this most important sector of the economy. Robertson. I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer and I look forward to him uh, visiting my constituency in the future. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you'll agree with me that despite the uh, Scottish Government efforts, uh, we still we don't seem to have enough uh, young girls and women coming into the industry. Can the Minister perhaps engage with the new Cabinet Secretary uh, for training youth and women's employment to see if we can rectify this? Minister. Uh, Yes, uh, I, I am happy and do work closely with Angela Constance on these and all other matters. Um, I should say to Dennis Robertson that there's rarely a week goes by where I'm not visiting his constituency, uh, uh, including this week. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm pleased to say that Energy Skills Scotland and Education Scotland are working together to develop a coordinated long-term plan for better partnerships between industry and schools uh, it is a, a lesser-known fact, presiding officer, that insofar as attracting more women uh, and more young women to pursue and wish to pursue a career in the oil and gas industry, that actually around about 90% of the jobs in the oil and gas industry are not offshore jobs. And I think that's something that, if we can explain more, may actually remove some of the misperceptions about the industry and lead to more young women being interested in taking up a career in what is uh, arguably our most successful sector. Question two, Drew Smith. Ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland's comment that the White Paper and Independence contained very little detail on tax. Cabinet Secretary John Smith. Presiding officer, Scotland's future sets out how taxation will operate in an independent Scotland and how this government plans to use tax powers to build a tax system which stimulates Scotland's economy, builds social cohesion and sustains our public services. Independence will guarantee for the first time that decisions about what taxes to apply in independent Scotland and at what level will only be taken with the approval of a parliament elected entirely by people in Scotland. Bruce Smith. The only thing we know for sure about a tax system in independent Scotland is the SNP's desire to engage in a reckless tax competition by cutting tax for big business by 3% more than the Tories ever would. But ICAS have highlighted the complete lack of information from the Scottish Government on the cost of creating a new tax system. The Scottish Government have said that it will be small and Scotland's accountants have asked how small is small. Will Mr Swinney tell Parliament how much he thinks setting up a new uh, tax system will cost? Does he know? I think what the, uh, the best way to answer Mr Smith's question is to say that independence provides the opportunity for Scotland, as I think has been acknowledged by a whole range of different experts in this field, to create a, a system which is more simple to administer, uh, more efficient in its organisation and more focused on the particular requirements of an independent Scotland. If we look at the UK system, with over 10,000 pages of tax legislation, 1,042 exemptions within the UK tax system in 2010 alone. We can see that the 
complex approach that has been taken to the tax system in the United Kingdom has not made for a tax system that is efficient or straightforward. Now, on the question of cost, um, the government has uh, set out detail on the way in which we would want to structure and take forward uh, the tax system in Scotland, what the proposals that we have brought to Parliament in relation to the, tax power, the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill demonstrate is that we can undertake tax administration in Scotland at a cheaper rate than is the case with the uh, propositions put forward by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, some 25% cheaper in relation to the uh, ta Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. And that's an illustration to Mr Smith of how an independent Scotland can take uh, decisions and approaches that better meet the needs of people in Scotland and deliver a greater degree of efficiency into the bargain. Um, Brown. Officer, in this year's budget there is £10 million, in next year's budget there is £40 million for the transitional costs of the Scotland Act taxes. What would be the transitional costs of devolving all of the taxes upon separation? Uh, well, that, uh, the, the definitive answer to that question would lie as a result of the negotiation that we undertake with the United Kingdom Government over how we use the existing apparatus of tax infrastructure in Scotland, principally in relation to the Inland Revenue, uh, uh, to the Pensions Administration and to the benefit system, and how we negotiated the arrangements of the use of those systems and their application in independent Scotland. And what that's an argument for is very early negotiation with the United Kingdom Government to prepare for an orderly transition to an independent Scotland in the aftermath of a yes vote in the referendum in September. Question number three is in the name of Mark Biagio. The member has not seen fit to join us to ask the question. I will expect an explanation from the member by the end of the day. Question number four, in the name of Kenny Gibson, has not been lodged. Uh, Mr Gibson is abroad on parliamentary duties. Question number five, Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that the future growth of the economy lies in a highly skilled workforce and what steps it will take to attract businesses to Scotland that require a highly skilled workforce. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, increased internationalisation with greater business investment and exports will drive future sustainable economic growth. A highly skilled and flexible workforce will help facilitate this and ensure Scotland remains an attractive location for inward investors, therefore building on our success to date in securing inward investment. In 2012, according to Ernst & Young, the number of jobs attracted from inward investment was, the second highest, uh, was at the second highest level in 12 years. And since 2008, SDI support has led to the creation or the safeguarding of over 33,000 planned jobs in Scotland. Alex Rowley. Yeah, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his, his, his response. I would have to confess that, and, and putting this question together, um, I had to add a bit about attracting businesses to Scotland to get the question to qualify to be able to be asked in this section. And I think for me that highlights the issue because where I'm trying to get to, and wouldn't the Cabinet Secretary agree, that we actually need to look at skills in terms of schools, primary, secondary schools, colleges, um, higher education, and crucially employers, and that key to the Scottish economy, whether it's inward investment or whether it's companies here, because I, I meet companies that say, they're having to recruit abroad because the skills aren't here. Do we not need a better joined up approach that, that brings all these partners together and drives the skill agenda so that we have people being able to get the jobs that are available in Scotland? Thank you for your speech, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, 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 well, I, 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 now, I now feel very anxious about saying I very much concur with Mr Rowley's uh, <laughs> remarks after the, um, the, um, the, the, the words of the presiding officer. And let me say to Mr Rowley that uh, I... I Despite the, um, the configurations of uh, parliamentary decisions on who answers what questions, I think what he's raised with me is an entirely relevant question for the issues that I confront. I think I agree entirely with him that uh, we must have cohesion and alignment in all of our approaches to skills and development um, from the earliest years of education. So, for example, uh, some of the problems that we have in occupational segregation um, for employees in their 20s are perhaps determined by steps that are taken in primary school when particular uh, opportunities and areas of activity will be talked about and discussed um, with greater relevance to, um, uh, to, to, to um, uh, males rather than females. And uh, we have to tackle these issues from 
uh, throughout the education system. I think what I would say to uh, Mr Rowley is that the Wood Commission report, I think, will give us a lot to think about and to address in this area. Uh, I think Sir Ian Wood has um, taken meticulous steps to ensure that we have the type of cohesive discussion that Mr Rowley is seeking in this respect. And I look forward to the publication of the Wood Commission report very shortly. Um, and the final point I'd raise is that Mr Rowley makes a, a, an entirely uh, a reasonable point about the need for business to be at the, at the epicentre of this discussion. And far too often, um, business is not closely immersed in the discussion about skills and skills development pipelines within our society. And if they were, we would be able to resolve many of the issues of demand and supply uh, that Mr Rowley has rightly highlighted. Well, we've got a speech in return. Uh, to allow us to make progress through the questions. Can I remind members the questions should be brief and can I remind um, the ministers I'd appreciate fairly brief answers. Question number six, Joe McAlpine. What measures it's considering to support turnout at local authority elections? Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is committed to improving voter turnout at all Scottish elections, including <coughs> local government elections. On the 9th of April, we published the consultation document, Scotland's Electoral Future, delivering improvements in participation and administration. The consultation is focused on how we can improve the quality of democracy in Scotland by encouraging wider engagement and participation in elections. It draws on a number of previous reports, men measures under consideration. Uh, include all postal voting, online voting and telephone voting, amongst other suggestions, which will be informed by a cross-party stakeholder roundtable I have convened, which met for the first time today. Uh, Joe McAlpine, and then I'm going to call Dennis Robertson after the answer. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. What specific measures could be considered to encourage more young people to participate in the democratic process? Minister. In addition to some of the measures that I've just mentioned, I will undertake alongside the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister uh, an event in Glasgow, Scotland's Future, a young voter event in partnership with other uh, stakeholders uh, such as Young Scots, Scottish Youth Parliament and Youth Link Scotland. So we look forward to hearing their suggestions on <clears throat> how to improve and engage with them further in the democratic process. Dennis Robertson. Yeah, and to ask the Minister what more can be done to encourage people from minority groups, uh, and especially those maybe with disabilities, to engage in the process and certainly to become uh, 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 candidates and hopefully be elected either to local authority or parliamentary uh, elections. Minister. The stakeholder group I've referred to has a wide range um, of opinion and, and representation. In addition to our collective duties as political parties, there is a specific uh, a pilot uh, underway uh, working together with Inclusion Scotland to deliver an internship uh, for people with disabilities to try and give greater exposure and involvement in the democratic process and in the parliament and if successful uh, we can roll it out more widely. Inclusion Scotland has been allocated funding of over £70,000 to run this programme. Question 7, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what experts it has consulted about the consequences of independence for interest rates. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government's views on monetary policy are based on the comprehensive work of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, which is comprised of internationally around economists. This a group of economic experts published a detailed report in February of last year, which includes proposals for currency and interest rates. Whilst they outlined that Scotland would have a number of credible options, they concluded that a formal monetary union would be in the interest of both Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. The Bank of England would continue to set a single interest rate for both Scotland and the rest of the UK, which makes sense for two economies uh, with such close trading patterns. Welcome to some. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it is particularly important when it comes to the economics of independence that we listen to independent experts? And is it not the case that all independent experts agree that there would be a sovereign debt premium even if there were to be monetary union? And is it not the case that the vast majority of those experts say that without a monetary union there would be an even higher interest rate premium? And indeed in the case of this, if the Scottish uh, Government was not to take on its share of debt, there would be an astronomic uh, interest rate premium. Five percentage, five percent on interest rates according to Jeffrey's Investment Bank. Cabinet Secretary. I think what, what I'd say to, to Mr Chisholm is that uh, clearly the Scottish Government's proposal is for um, uh, a, a monetary union between an independent Scotland and the rest of the UK. And I'm reminded that uh, a significant amount of independent opinion has judged that that would be in the best interests of both Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, not least of which um, most recently Professor Anton Muscatelli at the Economy Committee of this Parliament. 
Uh, if I look at other uh, contributions to the discussion, you find, for example, um, Standard & Poor's have said that an independent Scotland would qualify for our highest economic assessment. Um, Moody said that uh, all possible outcomes point to Scotland being amongst the wealthiest sovereigns in the world. Um, so I think there's a, a, a great deal to be um, you know, very sure about the credit rating of an independent Scotland. If I look also at the credit ratings of small countries of a size comparable to Scotland, I find that Austria, Finland, Denmark, uh, to name but three, have all got um, uh, lower um, interest rates, that, uh, lower um, uh, debt costs than the United Kingdom at the present time. So I think if we look at all of this evidence in the round, it demonstrates the arguments in favour of the proposals put forward by the Scottish Government. John Mason. Uh, yes, I know what the Cabinet Secretary says about Austria, and I just wonder if he can explain how it, how it can be that a smaller country like Austria uh, can end up with a lower interest rate than apparently a large country like the UK. Minister. Ultimately, it will come down to the way in which the um, stewardship of the economy has been undertaken yeah, in Austria. Right. And anyone looking at the stewardship of the United Kingdom's yeah. economy and demonstrating that we're now in a situation where we have debt that's heading for £1.5 trillion pounds indicates yeah. the degree of economic mismanagement when we look at the, uh, the, 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 the very strong public finances that existed around the turn of the century, um, from the late 1990s throughout the first decade of this century, how we could have ended up in, with the level of debt uh, that we have is a testament to the economic mismanagement of the United Kingdom. Gavin Brown. Yeah. Just for clarity, Presiding Officer, is it the Scottish Government's formal position or formal view that a separate Scottish Government would pay a lower rate of interest on government debt than the UK Government? What, what I'm, I'm simply illustrating to um, Mr Brown the comments that have been put in the public domain by ratings agencies. And I think they speak for themselves. They say that Scotland would qualify for our highest economic assessment. I think Mr Brown should, Mr. Brown should be cheerful about that and confident about that, that uh, he, can, he, can, he can go forward in the future with great certainty about the, foundations, uh, the, the, the economic foundations of an independent Scotland. I know it's only a matter of time before he realises this conclusion for himself. Question 8, Jean Urquhart. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what measures it's taking to sustain employment in Caithness and North Sutherland. Uh, through the Caithness and North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership, we're working to develop a resilient local economy and support sustainable job creation. Between 2008 and 2013, the partnership's actions secured commitments from 190 local businesses to create or maintain 750 jobs. These activities are complemented by over £100 million in infrastructure investment in the last five years, including £20 million in developing Scrabster Harbour. This investment supports jobs during construction, as well as building the asset base to support future economic development and job creation in growth sectors like renewables. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Um, finding new employment for workers in Dunray has been an ongoing theme of its decommissioning. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how this experience will inform other diversification in the future in places like Faz Lane in the event of independence? Uh, well well, certainly, my, my having met with representatives of the Caithness and North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership and also having taken part in discussions hosted by the Caithness Chamber of Commerce when I was last in Thurso um, a couple of years ago, I have been impressed by the way in which the very focused work of the partnership has actually brought together all relevant agencies to try to find ways of uh, reskilling and redeploying individuals who are um, involved in the work in Dunray, and crucially, to find other sustainable business opportunities to support employment within the Caithness uh, economy. Uh, so I think there are uh, wider lessons to be drawn from what I think has been um, a very good exercise in meeting what is a, 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 a change to the economic landscape in the north of Scotland which could have very dramatic implications for that local economy yeah. unless properly managed, which I think it is being properly managed uh, by the Keithness Partnership. Question number nine, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what, when ministers last met representatives of their local authorities. Minister Derek Mackay. 
Ministers meet representatives of local government regularly to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Mr Buchanan. Thank you. Following the revelation over the weekend that Edinburgh City Council has spent around £60,000 on attracting foreign investment or entertaining, that it had initially refused to release details of how these costs were accrued, can he give assurance that he will press home the importance of transparency to Scottish councils, when, particularly when resources are so scarce at the moment? Minister. Well, of course, this is a, a matter primarily for the City Council, and they will be judged by the electorate and how they choose to use uh, resources. Uh, I'm not aware of the, the full details. I'm happy to look further at it and advise Edinburgh City Council accordingly. But what I would say is Scotland's capital city, it should absolutely herald its successes and promote Edinburgh and Scotland across the, across the world. But of course, use resources wisely and transparently. Neil Findlay. Uh, when the Minister last met representat representatives of councils, did he discuss concerns about the planning system? In Kirk Newton, in my region, a planning application for a 190-foot turbine was rejected twice by the Council and by Ministers, only to be overturned behind closed doors by a second reporter inquiry. Will the Minister look at reforming the planning system to ensure it is fairer and more transparent, because at the moment it is heavily weighted against communities and in favour of developers? Minister. I would uh, disagree with Mr Finlay's comments around uh, the planning system. Essentially, the last Planning Act was agreed very much on a cross-party basis. In fact, the Labour Party were largely responsible for much of the legislation uh, going through. So if I think that the Planning Act has, has given the government powers that you regret, then you know, we should look across the, the chamber and reflect upon that point. I actually think the Planning Act is bedding down well. An appeals mechanism is necessary. I would disagree that uh, communities uh, aren't fully engaged, but are making great progress in both national planning framework, Scottish planning policy and delivery uh, on the ground in partnership with local authorities. And the last time that I met and discussed planning with Scotland's local authorities, no, they did not ask me to abolish the appeals system. Question number 10, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle low pay. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Uh, President Officer, the Government is leading by example in helping those on the lowest of incomes by ensuring that all staff covered by the public sector pay policy receive the Scottish living wage, which is above the statutory minimum wage. We encourage others to follow our example and have funded the Poverty Alliance to deliver a living wage accreditation scheme, which aims to increase the number of employers paying the living wage and make decent pay the norm in our country. James Kelly. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Following the debates on payment of the living wage and public contracts and the procurement bill, what measures uh, will the government put in place to monitor the payment of the living wage and public contracts? And would the Cabinet Secretary consider setting up a living wage unit uh, in order to assist with this process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I will certainly explore the issue raised by Mr Kelly um, in relation to um, the monitoring of these points. I, uh, I suspect that in the information that uh, we gather on contracts, and certainly if I think for uh, if a comparable example such as community benefit clauses, these are all monitored as part of the, um, the commitments that we undertake through public sector procurement. So there is certainly scope for us to consider the point that um, Mr Kelly makes. Uh, it is a serious point. Um, and obviously our work with the Poverty Alliance has been designed to engage um, organisations that have been critical to advancing the arguments in this respect uh, to gain wider participation within the living wage campaign. So I'll certainly ensure that consideration is given to the idea put forward by Mr Kelly and I'll write to him accordingly. Question number 11 in the name of Christian Allard has been withdrawn. The member has provided a most satisfactory explanation. Question number 12, Angus MacDonald. To, uh, excuse me, to ask the Scottish Government when it will publish the National Planning Fr Framework 3 and the revised Scottish Planning Policy. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, we will publish National Planning Framework 3 and the revised Scottish Planning Policy on the 23rd of June 2014. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply and the imminent publication of uh, NPF 3 and the SPP. I particularly welcome the proposed inclusion of the Grangemouth Investment Zone as one of the national developments, uh, as well as the CCS proposals for Grangemouth with appropriate environmental safeguards. However, can I ask the Minister how the recommendations from the committees of this Parliament have been considered as part of the NPF3 process? 
Minister. We well, provided an interim response to recommendations of Parliament's uh, committees earlier this month. The Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee highlighted the concerns of local residents about the impact of two proposed national developments at Grangemouth, and we're currently finalising MPF3 and taking these uh, concerns into account. A coordinated approach to the development in this area, as proposed in MPF3, will be key to balancing development aspirations and quality of life for local communities and the environment. Speaking more widely on the recommendation of Parliament's committees, I believe I have taken a number of process, policy and narrative contributions on board. I am sure members will be aware that I have gone further in the scrutiny process than the legislation required me to, and I have also offered to attend the Local Government Regeneration Committee to outline our final position. This all leads to an excellent plan for Scotland delivering sustainable economic growth. Question number 13 in the name of Rhoda Grant has been withdrawn. The member has provided a satisfactory explanation. Question number 14, Graham Day. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what conclusions emerged from the recent payday lending summit. Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is committed to tackling the rise in payday lenders and betting shops in Scotland's high streets. We have already taken steps to address this by securing passage of the bankruptcy and debt bill and by removing business rates relief from payday lenders, but we recognise that more needs to be done. I therefore chaired a summit on the 23rd of April that brought together a wide range of interests, including local authorities, financial advice services, welfare organisations and credit unions, to consider what further action could be taken. A report outlining the summit's discussions and conclusions will be published later this week. Those conclusions include the development of an action plan that will build on existing commitments and will be finalised in the near future in collaboration with stakeholders. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can I ask specifically whether there is scope for planning policies to be used to tackle the clustering of betting and payday loan premises in town centres? Derek Mackay. There are a number of options being considered, including changes to planning policy. The forthcoming action plan will divide, provide more detail on the way forward. I can confirm emerging planning policies will assist in tackling the clustering of payday lending and betting premises and working hard to maintain the cross-party support to achieve this within, a government, uh, within local government and parliament equally. I would restate that regulation would be much easier if the reserve powers were transferred to Scotland. Question 15, Jane Baxter. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it offers to community planning partnerships. Minister Derek McCann. The work of community planning partnerships is in the first instance primarily supported by Scottish Government funding through the statutory partner bodies. For instance, we are maintaining the local government finance settlements for both 2014-15 and 15-16 at over £10.6 billion, and our initial revenue resource allocations for territorial NHS boards in 2014-15 total more than £8.27 billion, 3.1 per cent higher than in 2013-14. The Scottish Government supports CPPs in other ways too. We intend to legislate in the forthcoming Community Empowerment Scotland Bill to strengthen community planning, including clear duties on public sector partners to support the work of CPPs. We are running a national conference for community plan practitioners and others on 5 June to share good practice. And with the Economic and Social Research Council, we are investing £3 million in What Works Scotland, an independent centre which will support CPPs building evidence on what works to deepen the impact of public service delivery and reform. I thank the Minister for that answer. There are many great examples of small community-based organisations in Mid-Scotland and Fife, including the Resonate Arts Project in Alawa, which I visited last week, and which takes a holistic approach to working with local people to build community resilience and capacity. Could I urge the Minister to ensure that support for community planning crosses all portfolios to ensure a sustainable long-term future for organisations like Resonate? Minister. Yes, of course. I think that's a very uh, valid point. I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Fife uh, just the other day to meet in a, a, a third sector conference uh, there, hearing from the third sector direct and some of the fantastic projects they're delivering around prevention and integration, uh, uh, people and improved performance, the very pillars of uh, Christie and our response uh, to Christie and public service reform. So absolutely the capacity of the third sector and community-led regeneration and support is critical delivering on this agenda and absolutely concur with the comments that have been made. Question 16, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I sent you a note. I'm sorry I arrived late. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to use tax powers to tackle wealth inequalities. Cabinet Secretary. 
Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has limited powers in its existing responsibilities to um, uh, exercise uh, the use of tax powers to tackle wealth, wealth inequalities, but where we, have where we have acquired new powers in terms of the Scotland Act, we have demonstrated um, our desire to deliver a progressive system, um, which is exactly the approach we have taken to the design of the land and buildings transaction tax and would seek to apply that in other forms of taxation where we have the responsibility to do so. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's answer, but you know, in order to fund the public services that so many communities need and deserve, uh, we need to tackle tax avoidance and uh, trusts and so on amongst rural and urban businesses. But since many of these tax powers are actually currently retained in Westminster, is there any discussion going on about how we can get control over some of these in order to help our economy to deliver for the, the communities I mentioned? Cabinet Secretary. Clearly, if the Parliament has a wider range of tax powers, it will have much greater flexibility to address these issues. I think on the issue of tax avoidance, I would reassure Mr Gibson, and I think this has been uh, welcomed across the political spectrum in Parliament, that the Government has demonstrated by the approach we have taken to the Revenue in Scotland and Tax Powers Bill uh, a determination to tackle the issue of tax avoidance and the general anti-avoidance rule that has been designed and which of course will be scrutinised by Parliament at stage two and at stage three uh, further deliberations um, is designed to um, establish our tax system on exactly the right footing where we make it clear our intolerance of tax avoidance and put in place the measures which we believe are of the widest possible scope uh, to tackle that. But as I have said to Parliament already, um, I am very willing to be challenged on the degree to which we could make that provision ever more effective than we have already designed uh, as part of the bill as it has been considered by stage one by Parliament. Usma. So, will the Cabinet Secretary take the opportunity to remind the radical voices behind him of uh, how slashing corporation tax uh, for big business and forcing regressive taxation, uh, regressive tax competition on the rest of the UK would result in a more equal Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think what uh, I would simply remind Mr Smith is that the Government has taken an approach which is designed to focus on how we improve and expand the economic base of Scotland. And, um, I would take Mr Smith more seriously, uh, however earnestly he tries to put forward these points of view about corporation tax, if he wasn't a member of a party that on two occasions dramatically reduced corporation tax. So, the, it, you know, it just it seems to be that the logic, the great intellectual logic of Mr Smith is it's all right if it's the Labour Party that's doing it, but it's not all right if it's anybody else that does it. I simply say that the Scottish Government has set out our argument about the advantage of encouraging and motivating investment through a competitive tax base. That doesn't mean to say that people who are obliged to pay tax are somehow exonerated from paying it. Those who are obliged to pay tax have got to pay the tax to which they're obliged, which is exactly what the general anti-avoidance rule that I'm establishing within statute is designed to do and to set the signal that whatever the tax rates decided and determined by Parliament, they must be followed and adhered to by all relevant parties. Margaret Fraser. Thank you. Um, at last week's meeting of this Parliament's Economy Committee, Dennis Canavan, who is the chair of the Yes Scotland campaign, said he wanted to see a radical redistribution of wealth in Scotland and tax policies that would bring that about. Does Mr Swinney agree? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the first thing I want to say is that um, Dennis Canavan is a man for whom I could not have the higher res respect. I sat with him in the House of Commons and in this Parliament and I saw the courageous things he had to deal with yeah. uh, politically and personally and I have nothing but the highest of admiration for Mr Canavan. He would of course be the first to say that he and I are not exactly two peas out of the same pod if I can use that gardening analogy for the benefit of anybody over there that's interested in gardening. Um, obviously there will be differences of opinion on the, um, the uh, amongst the various interested parties in the yes side. But what Mr Canavan and I are absolutely agreed on is that the only way we will attack the inherent inequalities of the United Kingdom is to acquire the powers of an independent Scotland and to then start resolving the issues of inequality in our society. Question 17, Jimmy Hepburn. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what would be the position of civil servants working for the UK Government in Scotland following a yes vote in the referendum. 
Cabinet Secretary. President officer, the Scottish Government will work with the, the Westminster Government to preserve continuity of employment for all civil servants in Scotland, either by transfer to the Scottish Government as we take on new, power, new functions or through continued employment by the Westminster Government where it continues to require their skills. UK civil servants transferring into the Scottish Government would benefit from our good employment practices, including a, commitment, a continued commitment to no compulsory redundancies. Jamie Hepburn. Uh, HMRC, which is a big employer in my constituency and across Scotland, and the DWP have experienced large cuts to numbers employed by their organisations in recent years. Uh, in 2004, uh, there was 40,500 job losses in these organisations, followed by further cuts in 2006. And we know the U current UK government is cutting back too. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the real risk to jobs in these services is the UK government's handling of them, and that the white paper commitment to transfer workers to the employment uh, of the Scottish Government with the policies that he has set out makes independence a much better prospect for such staff? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the, the Scottish Government took um, a very deliberate decision, despite all the economic challenges that we face, to provide um, a more stable employment environment for civil servants in Scotland through our commitment to no compulsory redundancies. Um, I think that has been a, a very welcome measure to, uh, amongst the employees involved. Um, they have had the security of knowing that their continuity of employment was assured and that if there was a requirement to reduce uh, staff numbers within the government's uh, organisation, it will be done by negotiation and agreement uh, with the relevant trade unions and individuals involved as part of any voluntary service or severance arrangement. So I think we've created and have every intention of maintaining um, a progressive approach to employment practices in the civil service in Scotland. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how far his policy of no compulsory redundancies extends in the public sector? I'm thinking specifically about the compulsory redundancies currently being considered for academic staff at Dundee University. I'm not well, sure it's quite relevant, but if you want to answer it, Cabinet Secretary, please do so. Well, uh, the, the, um, the University of Dundee is a self-governing institution. Although the government funds it, um, the University of Dundee is entirely uh, autonomous in determining the decisions that it takes. Clearly, the government leads by example, and the um, commitment to no compulsory redundancies applies to all bodies uh, over which the pay policy that the government uh, applies um, a, a, and the bargaining units that are relevant for that purpose a, 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 is where the policy applies. Question 18, Chick Brodie. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last reviewed the funding sources for social enterprises and what steps it is taking to support crowdfunding. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is in discussions with a range of stakeholders to identify opportunities for innovation and development and explore future approaches to ensure a buoyant and sustainable social enterprise and wider third sector. These discussions will continue throughout 2014 and will include future funding sources. Uh, I thank the Secretary for his well, he will be aware of the rapid growth of social enterprises and the voluntary and third sectors in recent years. Associated with this growth has been the growth in the number of funding sources, both private and public. Will the Cabinet Secretary now institute a full review of the many sources of funding to ensure that properly directed qualified financial support is given to likely winners in these sectors and that crowdfunding be considered as one such qualified investment vehicle? Cabinet Secretary. I think crowdfunding is an example of um, real innovation and I've seen a number of very successful measures to um, attract crowdfunding for social enterprises which have reaped very significant rewards. So I can assure Mr Brodie that that will be one of the areas that uh, is, is, is explored as part of the review that we undertake. I can also say to him that the government has set out and we set this out in 2007 as one of our uh, priorities was to expand the scope of social enterprise activity in Scotland. We have seen that significantly across the country and I can give Mr Brody the assurance that we have every intention of encouraging that in the years to come. Question 19, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has put in place to increase the number of business start-ups in Glasgow. Brief as you can, Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to creating the economic environment to enable businesses to start up and to thrive. The latest official start-up figures, published by the ONS in December 2013, show that there were 2,300 new business registrations in Glasgow 
uh, in 2012 up from 2,220 in 2011. Uh, this presiding officer is the third consecutive year in which the number of startups in Glasgow has increased. It will need to be brief, Ms McTaggart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Um, women in Scotland continue to be half as likely as men to establish a business um, in light of the significant entrepreneurial potential of Scotland's women that remains untapped. What specific measures have the Scottish Government taken to address this concerning gender gap in business start-up rates? Minister. Well, we've taken a very large number of measures and Angela Constance is uh, driving this work forward, as the, the member well knows. Uh, we supply over 92,000 businesses in Scotland with low or no business rates. We have enormous support from the business gateway uh, and we encourage more women to consider self-employment uh, as a, a successful means of, of uh, supporting the economy. So we entirely support uh, the efforts which the member supply, uh, talks about. My apologies to Mr Lamont. I did my absolute best to get to your question, but unfortunately um, time has caught up with us. The next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown on the Caledonian Sleeper franchise. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement. There should therefore be no interference.